um, welcome everyone to the peripheral nerve session in the Brain 2021 conference. And I'm delighted to chair the session, which is a hopefully a comprehensive session, which will cover inherited neuropathies, inflammatory neuropathies, and neuropathic pain with a mixture of presentations and platforms. I hope you found it both educational and informative. So I'm going to kick off with a talk on approaching the diagnosis in inherited neuropathies in 2021. I'm going to give a brief introduction and then really move on to a diagnostic approach. Now, the inherited neuropathies, even though I will focus on those, are actually a really good example of neurogenetic diseases. And the approach I describe, even though it will focus on the inherited neuropathies, is certainly the approach and the complexities and problems are exactly the same as you see in other neurogenetic diseases. And the reason for that is the inherited neuropathies are common affecting one in 2,500 to one in 10,000. They have clinical complexity. And what I mean by that is that they have both neuropathies, which where the neuropathy is the sole or primary part of the disease, such as the classic Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, which is a motor and sensory neuropathy, but other sole neuropathies include hereditary motor neuropathy and hereditary sensory neuropathy. So when I talk about CMT during this talk, I mean that group of diseases. But we also see neuropathies as part of multi-system genetic disorders. And with the advent of next generation sequencing, this area has really exploded. A few years ago, we wrote a paper to try to give some diagnostic help in this group of disorders. And at that stage, we'd recognize 155 complex neuropathies, where there is now over 300. And as you would predict, the commoner ones are ones associated with ataxia and spasticity, but there's a whole other group of conditions that we see where neuropathy is part of the syndrome. The third thing about the inherited neuropathies is they are genetically complex. So like many genetic neuromuscular diseases and neurological diseases, there's multiple genes, and they can be divided into those genes that affect the Swan cell and the myelin sheets, such that they're called CMT1 when we're talking about CMT, and those that affect the cell body and axon, which are called CMT2 when we're talking about CMT2. But unlike other neurogenetic diseases, the first and commonest cause of CMT is actually quite a complex genetic cause. That is a duplication of 1.4 megabases of chromosome 17, such that it is three copies of the gene PMP22 that causes the common type of CMT, CMT1A. But of course, since that was first identified in 1991, there's been multiple genes described to cause the dominant and the recessive forms of CMT. And in the more complex diseases, such as Friedrich's ataxia and spinocerebellar ataxia, we see repeat expansion disorders. So the inherited neuropathies are quite a good group of diseases to discuss genetic diseases because of this clinical and genetic complexity. So how do we approach the diagnosis in genetic diseases? Well, as clinicians, we always see the patients first. So we start with phenotype in the patients, and traditionally, we then move to trying to make a genetic diagnosis. But increasingly, we have a huge role in seeing patients when they have genetic results, which are quite hard to interpret because there can be multiple variants, and that may be also the first time we see the patients. So this part of the equation has now become much busier. Of course, it starts with the patient. If you don't think that this might be hereditary, you will not make the diagnosis. And that can be very easy in clear patients with a family history. But in the adult with what looks like a sporadic disease, you're looking for clues like a long history or the presence of foot deformity to alert you that this may be hereditary. Accurate phenotyping is critical. So in neuropathy, neurophysiology, trying to see if it's slow conduction such as CMT1 or faster conduction with low amplitude such as CMT2 is really very important as part of the diagnosis. And in some patients, you will be able to sort out the inheritance in clinic, whether it's dominant, recessive and X-linked. But in many adults, you don't know this and you say they are sporadic because you haven't got an obvious family history. Once you've done that, there's a large range of things you can do genetically. And I think unlike most other neurogenetic diseases, we still use a single gene analysis for the chromosome 17 duplication using something like MPLA or another way of doing dosage. So because this is so common, it accounts for over 60% of most cohorts of CMT, unless it's a large consanguineous population. It is usually done by a dosage test because it's cheap. Now, increasingly, you can do the chromosome 17 duplication more modern um, whole genome sequencing 
techniques, but at the moment, it's much more cost effective to do this first. But once you've that done, you then have to see how will you look for all of the other genes. And we really no longer use single gene analysis, but we have a range of things we can do. So if we look at a diagrammatic representation of the genome, 2% is the exome, and that contains our 20,000 coding genes. So we can look at the whole 20,000 genes, or we can look at a panel of genes, such as the CMT panel of 100 genes, or a neurogenetic panel, or a neuromuscular panel, or we can look at the whole genome. And the rest of the genome doesn't contain genes, but it contains regulatory places that affect the expression of these genes. And also, although the genes may structurally look normal, they are the genes that are affected by mutations in the rest of the genome. But it's quite difficult sometimes to appreciate what this means. And it's very important for diagnostic practice. So this is a particular gene. And the dark gray parts are the exons. And the exons are the part of the gene that are translated into the protein. Now, as you will see in this gene, and indeed in most genes, the vast majority of the mutations are in the exons. And that is what you look at when you do gene panels and whole exome sequencing. But you have a huge amount of genetic material in the introns between the exons and outside the gene in the five promoter or three promoter areas are re more remote than that. So you need to remember what you're getting when you get a result. So with a gene panel, or a whole exon panel, you are getting the exons of the genes, where theoretically with the whole genome, you have the whole genome, and that can give you the introns and can look for expansions and rearrangements. But in diagnostic practice, whole genome doesn't usually give you all of this yet. So in the NHS in the UK, we do, do have whole genome sequencing, but what we get is a sophisticated panel of genes looked at within the whole genome. So often we still use whole genome for novel gene discovery. So it is important if you get a result of whole genome, you ask what was done with the sample. Was it just a panel of genes looked at or was there an exploration for new expansions? So that is quite important moving forward. So most of the data we have is looking at targeted disease specific panels as that what was, is what we've been using to date. And what about in inherited neuropathy? So this is a paper we published last year. So we looked at our practice in the UK where the diagnostic lab is embedded in hospitals versus Mike Shai, a colleague in the US that uses commercial labs. And we get the same overall rate in CMT, about a 73% hit rate. And I looked at my practice again late last year, and it's up to about 77%. But as you will see, we're much better at CMT1 than the exonal form, CMT2, HMN, and HSN. So that all my dominant CMT1 cases are solved. There's a few recessive cases not solved. But the problem with the axonal cases is that many of them are apparently sporadic and much more difficult to solve. But this is the biggest challenge in genetic diagnosis to date. It is the VUS, the variant of unknown significance. And I'm sure many of you will have seen complex reports like this that I got on one of my patients. So there's a list of tests done at the bottom. And up here, there's a heterozygous sequence in dynin of unknown significance. But if you look at the whole report, there's a mutation in myelin protein zero, there's a mutation in dynin, and you read through it, and it's really difficult to work out how relevant this is. So what can you do as a clinician? Well, first of all, is the phenotype appropriate? Now, I know we said the phenotypes are expanding, but if you have a large autosomal dominant family with demyelinating CMT and you find the chromosome 17 duplication, you can be pretty comfortable there is an appropriate phenotype. Increasingly, clinicians have to undertake segregation within families, and I'll come back to that. The absence of a mutation in controls is really important. And with the increasing next generation sequencing databases, this has become better. For instance, the NOMAD resource but it's biased towards Caucasians and Asians, particularly Southeast Asians. And in somewhere like London, where you have a multi-ethnic population, certainly in our African patients, we completely do not have the controls we need. You will see in your reports, conservation in species and predictive programs. And the predictive programs are only as good as what is known about the gene and protein. So for newer genes, these are not always right. So I put less emphasis on these than absence and controls and segregation. But the big problem in neuropathy is we do not have functional analysis. So for most of our genes, there is no functional test which is easily applicable. 
So what I'm going to do now is take you through examples of some of them that I've got wrong, all of them that I've learned from, but which I think exemplify the problems. The first is a 24-year-old male whom I first saw in 1999. He had a very typical history of CMT, onset first decade, walking difficulties, sensory loss, and a slowly progressive neuropathy. In his family, he was the only one affected, and I had seen both parents who were normal with normal nerve conduction. So this is going to be either recessive or de novo dominant. His electrics were clearly demyelinating, absent sensory action potentials, reduced CMAPs, but enough CMAPs present in the upper limbs to say it's clearly demyelinating. So the next slide, it's almost like the history of genetic testing over the last 20 years. And you can see it took me a long time to get there. So when he came to me in 99, he'd already had the chromosome 17 duplication done, it was negative. And then we did what we all did back then, sequentially sequenced causative genes with CMT1 and they were negative. About 10 years ago, we did a CMT1 panel, which was negative. About five years ago, we did whole exome sequencing, which was negative. And about 12 months ago, we did whole genome sequencing and we had no candidates. So what do you do when you get there? After 21 years, you have no diagnosis. Well, you should always reassess the case and have a rethink. So I tried to blindly look at this patient again and have a rethink. And I thought if I was seeing the patient for the first time, I would think he had the chromosome 17 duplication. So I went back to my notes and I found that when he was sent to me, indeed it was negative, but it was done by microsatellite testing error. And we know there is a slight error rate of one to 2% with this. So I wondered if we had got it wrong. So we went back and looked at his whole genome and this is the 17 P area and these are his two alleles. Now this is a control patient where the two alleles look they're like they're the same size. But look at our patient. This is one allele and this is the other. It looks about one and a half times the size. So we went back and did it by MPLA. We found he actually had a de novo chromosome 17 duplication. So for 21 years, literally thousands of pounds, we had got it wrong. So this example shows you carefully evaluate all cases. And if the phenotype is very typical, the test may be wrong. So tests evolve, and even what we're doing now with next generation sequencing may be out of date in a few years' time. So always reassess the test to see could the diagnosis be right. The second case was a 55-year-old man who's referred to me at 55, but haven't been under Great Ormond Street as a child with a typical history of CMT. Quite severe, he'd had 12 operations on his feet, triple arthrodesis, and he came to me because he was developing new lower limb weakness and some increasing hand problems. And as you see, very skinny legs, pretty good feet shape following his surgery, wasting of his hands and a marked kyphosis. His electrics again showed a demyelination neuropathy, absent sensory action potentials, reduced CMAPs, but again, he did have homogeneous slow conduction. And in his case, there was a family history. His brother had the same phenotype and I saw his brother before he died and confirmed he had the same phenotype and electrics. Now there was an interesting family history in that the father had died pretty young and in his forties, but the father was meant to have what's called chicken legs. Now I hadn't heard that description before, but the family used to tease him about these really skinny legs. So that's something we put into the soft basket. He'd never been seen by a doctor. He sounded like he walked pretty well. So we said possible autosomal dominant. And of course, we did the chromosome 17 duplication, which was negative. Now, when I saw this family, it was a few years ago. And the next thing we did was a CMT1 dominant panel. And we had a hit almost immediately. He had a novel mutation in LITTAF. And LITTAF is a gene that causes autosomal dominant CMT1, which is called CMT1C, and is clinically indistinguishable for CMT1A. So I was quite excited. I thought we've got the appropriate phenotype. It's a novel mutation, but it's absent in controls, and it's predicted to be pathogenic. So what did I do next? I looked for segregation, and it did segregate. His brother had the same mutation. And I thought I had the diagnosis right, and for two years I told the family this was the likely diagnosis. But then his sister turned up. She was normal normal nerve conduction studies, and she also had the mutation. And of course, if this mutation was causative, her conductions should have been slow. So this meant this was not the causative mutation. And we went back to the drawing board and did a full panel and found they had a recessive gene, SH3TC2, and they had compound heterozygous loss of function mutations. And in this case, it segregated properly. Both patients had two mutations, but the sister was a carrier of one. So this was the right diagnosis. So there's a couple of lessons here. First of all, beware chicken legs. 
So if you hear that somebody in the family has a phenotype, you just cannot believe it unless you've got their medical records or you've seen them. And secondly, there was a clinical clue. There was quite severe kyphosis. And although you do see that with CMT, with SH3TC2 mutations, you do see it more commonly. So the message here is segregation, segregation, segregation. You've got to do this when you have novel mutations. You have to be really careful. It segregates with the disease in the family. The third example is a 48-year-old female who presented at three late walking with walking difficulties. She had a slowly progressive neuropathy characterized by significant large fiber involvement, hearing loss, and mild scoliosis. She came from a family with three affected, and there was a little clue here because two of them had trigeminal neuralgia. Now, we don't see trigeminal neuralgia commonly with CMT, but when I do, it tells me they've thick fifth nerves, which usually means it's a demyelination neuropathy. The parents were normal and had normal nerve conduction studies, so this is suggestive of recessive inheritance. And her electrics also showed slow conduction, absent sensory action potentials, reduced or absent lower limb CMAPs, and slow conduction. Now, she had a problem that we see commonly. Her panel showed a single gene, a single mutation in a gene which causes autosomal recessive CMT1. This is again the SH3TC2. And those of you that get these reports will see them all the time. So this is not surprising because you will see heterozygous carriers in the normal population. We all carry five or six so-called pathogenic heterozygous mutations that would need to have a second hit to cause the disease. And usually this would be reported as not relevant probably. But we were suspicious about this because the phenotype she had with the scoliosis, with the large fiber sensory taxes made us think, is there something we're missing on the other allele? So our diagnostic lab went back and had a look at the other allele and they just wondered about exon 7, but it wasn't clear enough. And she had been entered into our whole genome project. And because we knew where to look, Menelaus Pepis, our research fella, looked at exon 7 and found it was deleted. So we were then able to go back to the diagnostic lab, do long range PCR and confirm this deletion, confirming that this was autosomal recessive compound heterozygous. So this brings up the problem of the single heterozygous mutations in autosomal recessive genes. And this is difficult because the report says a pathogenic mutation. I don't like that way of reporting things because it's only pathogenic for the patient if there's something on the other allele. So if you get one of these, look at the phenotype, have a think, do you expect something other than the other allele? Or maybe it's not relevant and it's just one of these things you will see, but always think of these because these are very common seen in practice. So those were, those were three examples of common problems we see. Diagnosis not established and there was a wrong result from a test years ago. Segregation not being done properly the first time in a novel gene. And thirdly, when you actually have a single heterozygous mutation in an autosomal recessive gene. And these are kind of problems we see in all neurogenetic diseases. For the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about missing genes. Now, I told you we had about a 77% diagnostic rate. And if you asked me a few years ago, what was going to be in the missing bag, I would have said multiple rare genes accounting for two or three families each. Well, I was wrong. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of things we've discovered in the last two years. And the first is, and these are both using whole genome and whole exome. And the first is a gene we published last year as part of a large multinational group, which novel gene discovery is often done by now. And this is an autosomal recessive form of CMT due to biallelic mutations in SORD. And this work was led by Andre Cortese, who is now a colleague, but was a clinical postdoc with me at the time. And this is a very interesting gene because it's an enzyme, sorbitol dehydrogenase. And when you have two mutations, you get a loss of function of the enzyme and an increase of sorbitol, which already have been linked to neuropathy with diabetes. And the patients are very typical CMT patients. Average age of onset 17, incredibly mild, slowly progressive neuropathy. And you can see all the patients here. A very typical, nothing very distinguishing about them. But what's interesting is that all of the patients were either homozygous or compound heterozygous for one particular mutation, which turns out to be one of the commonest Mendelian mutations ever described and commoner than any other mutation in autosomal recessive CMT, such that we'd estimate one in 100,000 people in the population would have this disease. 
And it accounts for 10% of my unsolved CMT2 and distal HMN cases. And I won't go into the obvious question is how we all missed it, but we all missed it because it's a pseudogene. So it just brings up the problem that with all these sophisticated next generation techniques like whole exome and whole genome, we use these things called pipelines. And every time you go down a pipeline, you exclude stuff you don't think is relevant and you're open to mistakes. And this was one of these examples. So again, don't always believe test results and relook at those same techniques a few years later. The second one I'm just going to mention very briefly is again led by Andre, and this was a new disease, so a new recessive repeat expansion in the intron of replication factor C1 gene. And this causes canvas, cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy, and vestibular irreflexic syndrome, which has turned out to be the commonest cause of late onset ataxia. And the reason I mentioned this is in our series, it account, the allele frequency in the population was 1%, but in other series, this has been described in up to 5%. So this is as common, if not slightly commoner, than Friedrich's ataxia. So what did I learn from these two missing genes? Well, that I was wrong. There were still major genetic causes to be found, and that is the power of whole genome sequencing. I learned about the burden of autosomal recessive genes in neurological diseases, including late onset, and be aware of that in your practice. When you see a sporadic late onset, it could be recessive. We found out about technical difficulties with next generation sequencing and the importance of continuing to think of repeat expansion disorders. So what is the future? Well, the future is here and the future is whole genome sequencing. But with the whole genome comes multiple variants and a lot more work to needed to be done to validate these. So as a neurologist, what can you do? You can do appropriate phenotyping. Segregation within families is critical. And we've all got used over the last 30 years of doing weekly radiology MDTs to look at MRI scans. I, for about the last decade, have done weekly genetic MDTs. And whatever way you practice, you will need to set up some sort of MDT with your geneticist, be they clinical or lab-based, in order to be able to deal with these results. And for unsolved cases, I would suggest research collaborations. Just to finish, we've published this paper about 18 months ago, really talking about what we perceive as the role for whole genome sequencing and diagnostic practice. And as part of that, we've done really an algorithm to help people with particular clinical clues to validate genes. So I hope I've given you at least a flavor of a diagnostic approach to the inherited neuropathies. And just to acknowledge my funders, my team, and I thought I'd finish with a picture of the Queen Square Center for Neuromuscular Diseases group. This was our away day in 2019. Now, clearly, we haven't had an away day last year, and we all look forward to being able to physically be together again and not to be wearing masks. But I thought it'd be nice to finish with that positive note going forward. Thank you very much, and there's time for a couple of questions. So I'm just going to open the questions. So somebody asked in patients with sporadic axonal neuropathies, what criteria do I use? Well, I think first of all, it depends on what's available. So what we do in practice at the moment, we do our panel of genes first, and then we also we enclose that we actually enroll them into our research for either whole exome or whole genome. But I think the biggest criteria we use, the bigger the family, we know the more likely we're going to get a result. So that's really, it's the clinical and EMG together that we use and the size of the family. Now, should point mutations that are, that's a very good question. Should point mutations that are identified by next generation sequence always be confirmed by Sanger sequencing? So our practice at the moment is yes, but I think that will change. I mean, I think the problem is at the moment, not the panel ones, the panel ones we don't, but the Sanger, because they are very rare, but the ones with whole X and whole genome we do. And I think that will, while there's still been validation be done, that will need to be done, but it will be changed. But at the moment we do do all of that. So, in, and if there are no other questions, I know this is an area which is difficult for a lot of people because I think the problem is it's great to talk about what you can do if you have it available, but not everyone will be in the same place with having both their um, whole exome, whole genome available. 
Now, the second question, the last question, there isn't a, cur a current trial for SORD because the medications, you're absolutely right, the medications that are used, the sorbitol dehydrogenase inhibitors that are used for um, diabetes. But there is, we have a preclinical study looking at these in a Drosophila model, and we have a natural history study to be ready for trial. So if anyone is interested, please just email me and I'll send you the results of that. Okay, so thank you very much for the questions.